was relentless and senseless. The okay. summer stinks, summertime beefs, and it was endless. Okay. It was a focus on plans prior made, sitting back, relaxing in the shade. They dreaming of ways of getting paid. Now, a lesson starting life with a file, introduction. Some say I'm bugging. Nobody ever showed me loving. I want to trust in. Fuck it, I commenced the bussing. Commotion in my hood, my neighbors was fussing. You know, we got all that done, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. That's going in there. That's going in there. That's a freestyle, man. For sure. <laughs> Thank everybody for coming out, making this project possible. Um, it's the most important film I think I'm making so far, or that we make it. Me and Jeremy start third film together, like third in a row. Um, so yeah, just want to thank you all. Um, the work ethic so far has been great, and um, you know, let's just keep it going. But yeah, we better go for this take. Let's do that. My involvement with Right On started the moment that I met Zachary and Jeremy uh, Brockman, his cinematography partner, at um, a filmmaking event. I felt that in that moment, like, you know, the professional connection, the mutual respect um, was there for sure. Um, we definitely exchanged information. We talked about, like, hey, you know, if there's a thing in the in the future where we can kind of collaborate and bring our best selves to the table, let's do that. Um, you know, I'll I'll hit you up when the right project comes along. And I'm like, yes, uh, saw Little Church, loved it. And whatever that guy was going to do, I wanted to be a part of it for the next time. Um, read the script for Right On, fell in love, loved the idea that it's going to be in 16 millimeter. So, you know, that started my involvement. Uh, so a lot of it is very logistic. A lot of it is very much on the front end and in the back end. Um, but I love what I do. Direct from our newsroom in Washington, in color. This is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite and Russ Hodge in Memphis, Tennessee, Dan Rather in New York, Bernard Kalb in Saigon, Marvin Kalb in Wellington, New Zealand, and Bert Quint in Khe Sanh, South Vietnam. Good evening. Dr. Martin Luther King, the apostle of nonviolence in the civil rights movement, has been shot to death in Memphis, Tennessee. Police have issued an all-points bulletin for a well-dressed young white man seen running from the scene. Officers also reportedly chased and fired on a radio-equipped car containing two white men. Dr. King was standing on the balcony of a second-floor hotel room tonight when, according to an, a companion, a shot was fired from across the street. In the friend's words, the bullet exploded in his face. Police, who have been keeping a close watch over the Nobel Peace Prize winner because of Memphis' turbulent racial situation, were on the scene almost immediately. They rushed the 39-year-old Negro leader to a hospital where he died of a bullet wound in the neck. 
Police said they found a high-powered hunting rifle about a block from the hotel, but it was not immediately identified as the murder weapon. Mayor Henry Loeb has reinstated the dusk-to-dawn curfew he imposed on the city last week when a march led by Dr. King erupted in violence. Governor Buford Ellington has called out 4,000 National Guardsmen, and police report that the murder has touched off sporadic acts of violence in a Negro section of the city. Very sad news for all of you, and I think uh, sad news for all of our fellow citizens and people who love peace all over the world. And that is that Martin Luther King was shot and was killed tonight. There is a kind of overlap, and um, I felt like, okay, like my dad kind of explained to me how they felt, but I'm like, imagine if six months, like, like imagine if you have, if you have like these, these riots or this rebellion in your city, you see your city literally burn and all of these kind of things that happen after it. Um, and then six months later, the proverbial leader of the of black people in America uh, passes away like that. That's got to be kind of tough, um, just for black people in general. So we really just wanted to kind of explore that and sit in um, with those people. Yeah, Fred and Jimmy are too. Baby, Fred got a guy that's gonna get us a print by the first of the month. Fred's guy. Come on, man. You need to check out your friend. That guy ain't nothing but trouble. Baby, come on. He wants just as bad as we do to keep Larry's name alive. Now, them goddamn pigs need to answer for what they done did. They do. In essence, uh, right on, for, at least from a filmmaking standpoint, like if I go from a technical standpoint, is really an homage to um, killer of sheep. You are not a child anymore. You soon will be a goddamn man. Um, the dance scene in Right On is a direct reference to Killer of Sheep, to a dance scene in um, Killer of Sheep. Even though Killer of Sheep is about the 70s, um, Right On is about the late 60s, um, I definitely pulled from that. I was like, man, that's what I want to do. And so I would say that is when um, the story began kind of festering um, within myself. It is my first time shooting on film, and it is a very, hmm, it's a serene, it's a real serene experience because it gives you time to gather yourself, especially in a movie like this. In a movie like Right On, we don't just hit the pavement running. And so um, the takes in between, the cuts, the fast cuts, I mean, it's, it's different than what I've ever experienced before, but it allows my character, it allows me to just become one and to gather myself. I've never portrayed um, this era before and to fully commit, at one point I had my eyes closed as um, Kells was taking my hair down and then I had the outfit on, I opened my eyes and I'm like, hey Nora. And it's like I met her right there in the mirror. This is, it's different because I believe in the project and I connected to this character in a, in a whole different way. All right, Don, now get up and walk over to the... And Debbie, you just stay there for a bit. Just look up at him. Cut! Cut! My motivation in this um, film is to keep my husband alive. It's 1968 and um, we're mad as a people. We're upset and we're tired. And um, 
he's brave, he's fearless, and he has a message. He has a message. He has something to say to the masses. But I know, as a wife, that if he does this, something could happen. Um, and so I want to keep him alive. But I'm, I'm kind of behind the passion as well because of what happens next. Now Martin Luther King dies and it's, it, we feel like all hope is lost. And so we do need a voice, but I just don't want it to be my husband, you know. My character, Horace, his motivation stems from he's living uh, in the late 60s and at this particular time there's a lot of uh, un unjust, unrest, I mean you name it, you know, racism in America, this is almost like at its peak, you know, and he's fed up, he's tired of, of, of dealing with that, so his outlet is to fight it. Maybe I gotta finish what I started. The director, Zachary Cunningham, you know, he let us know right off the rip. Hey, look, we don't have that many takes, so you got, you're gonna have to bring it. Uh, I'm not, uh, you know, a stranger to that because I'm in, you know, I've done a lot of theater, um, which I highly recommend to a lot of actors, you know. Um, so having that background. Um, it doesn't scare me to know that, you know, we're limited in terms of how many takes we're going to get, you know. A lot of times, you know, uh, somebody messed something up and it's like, hey, here's 30 takes later, we got a good take. But with this, you know, he let us know up front, hey, look, we got to shoot, you know what I'm saying, and hit that target uh, as quickly and as fast as we can, you know what I'm saying. And, uh, um, so. Yeah, that, that brought about, you know, a challenge because, again, you want to kind of bring your A-game as soon as he calls action, so. On us eight months ago, brother. Right on. What? We are shooting on Super 16. So from an actor's perspective, um, I'm used to being able to do a lot of different stuff on newer technology. The fact that we're shooting Super 16 uh, makes me prepare a lot more efficiently because I know everything has to be caught at a certain way and a certain angle. And I don't really have too much wiggle room to do stuff. So it's kind of an interesting process, actually. Um, and I think it's something that will take me a lot further in my actually acting career, being able to shoot on Super 16 and say I shot on Super 16. So I think that's pretty dope, actually. I love the picture that we have, that we took, where it's, it's like me and the four actors and we're sitting at the, um, and they're sitting at the table and I got my arm around, I think Brian and Tim. And um, because like, when you, just a photo, it feels like the 60s. It feels like when you look at those characters, it feels like the 60s. And so that's certainly a testament to both Mike Oak and my wife um, in terms of like the art department. That's a wrap on day one, man. It was a tremendous first day, man. Talk to him, man. Hold on, the lighting I just isn't right. I tell y'all my album coming out at midnight. You know what I'm saying? And my mixtape. You know, it's right. called uh, Cauliflower Chicken Nuggets. Man, you know it's about to go double uranium, son. Exactly. Gang, 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 gang. <laughs> you said gang. Z sent me a lot of different videos. Um, footage from 1960s and stuff like that. So I really just tried to put myself in that time frame and just really take all the notes that he gave me as far as like my character is really like technically the smartest person in the room but he's the youngest person in the room so he doesn't have the experience to necessarily back up all of the intelligence that he has some of the inspirations that i use was actually just watching a lot of stuff about martin luther king because that is what the film is about, is our reaction to his death. So really just how would I feel like if I was in that time frame and I found out Martin Luther King got shot. And my character went to Morehouse, Martin Luther King graduated from Morehouse. So um, I'm sure like my character was really, really kind of looked up to him. 
So, yeah, that was important to him. So, you have the typical process of crew sets up lights, you know, typically, typically you go up for take one, which is really a rehearsal in most, di most digital sets. And then, you know, take two or three is probably like the one that you get, at least in short films. Cause you, I mean, most, like you hear the stories about directors getting like 50 takes and stuff like that, on, but on short films, that really doesn't happen. And when you're shooting on film, um, it's a little bit different. So they set up everything and then you have to rehearse two or three times. All right, reach out with the left. Mm -hmm. All right, cat daddy, I see you. As a director, it forces me to be present. It forces the actors to be present. And thank God that all of the actors who were uh, participating on Ride right On have stage experience. Because when you're shooting on film, it's similar to stage experience. Like, you can't just be like, oh, like, hold off for a minute. Um, hey, get this out of here. Let's come in here. Okay, now you can go. Now action. No, like, you have to nail it. And the crazy thing that a lot of people won't understand, to me, in my opinion, and I think a lot of people will agree with this who've seen most of my films, Ride right On is by far the best performed film that I've ever directed. And that is directly, the, the actors in this film are directly responsible for that. And the crazy thing is, is that they were all working on like one or two takes every single time. Like scene five literally only cuts one way. <laughs> it only cuts one way. Hit our people with the knowledge and them pigs with the facts. <laughs> Boy, you's a smart nigga. You know that, right? If you try to cut it any other way, it doesn't work. You know, so the final, so the way that you guys see it, like, I mean, just again, like appreciate what these actors did because they carried us to the finish line on this project. So here's what I'm thinking of when we do with this, this behind the scenes. Because Zach was saying he wanted to make it into, I'm not. He wanted to make it into a movie, mm -hmm. or like his own documentary. Mm -hmm. So I was thinking, make it what it is. This is the behind the scenes for the story of making, you know, so exactly. So. Yeah, that's pretty dope.